let's go. Oh. <laughs> hey everyone, and welcome back to season three of the VIP Collective. To kick off season three, we are connecting with Stephanie Mark, who is the co-founder of the fashion and lifestyle brand Coveture. Stephanie Mark is also a client under the Karim McDonald Films Wedding Cinema brand, and we had the opportunity to tell her story in July of 2019. Now, the COVID tour has been known to pave the way for what is up and coming in the digital fashion and lifestyle space. What started as a passion project between three friends in Toronto, Canada, quickly gained traction once they saw their website crash from overwhelming traffic on launch day. Now, after this, they knew they were onto something. The sleepless nights and the hard work led them to build the global empire, Covertour. This is a brand that is known for exploring the closets and homes of tastemakers around the world. The journey began in 2011, and today, Stephanie walks us through how it began, and then we hear about her wedding day, and she offers us some of her best advice. As always, guys, I wanna thank you for watching. If you like this episode, please feel free to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and check back next Wednesday as we have another episode for you on the VIP Collective. Let's go. Today we are sitting with Stephanie Mark. Stephanie Mark is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of The Couverture, and not only that, she is also a former bride of the Karim McDonald Films wedding cinema brand. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, the best cinema brand ever. <laughs> Whenever people watch the video, they like have a nervous breakdown. They're like, this is the best video, Ryan, my husband, like wherever we go. Like, uh, seriously, unacceptable, because he's like, do you want to watch our wedding video? I was like, not everyone we meet wants to watch our wedding video, but he just loves it so much. Oh, my goodness. Well, and I talk about this a lot, actually, is that when I came to meet you, and I was with your mom and Ryan, I was sharing some of the films, and uh, Ryan was so cute. At one point, he was watching the films. He had to stand up, because he's like, I have goosebumps right now. <laughs> I know he was, yes, he was a very, he just loves everything that you do, which is why when I made the video for his birthday, I was like, he's going to freak out that I did it with you because he just loves your work so much. Uh, well, you're both very sweet. And I want to thank you for allowing us to capture your day and tell your story because it was phenomenal. And we are going to get into your wedding day. But before we do that, I want to thank you, number one, for taking time to sit in, because I know you have a very busy schedule. It was um, my honest pleasure. And just giving our audience a little bit, we're switching up the content a little bit. So you're going to talk to us a little bit about yourself, your wedding, and then a little bit of your business journey with the COVID tour. So very excited today. <laughs> now, actually, the other thing I wanted to mention, too, was how we originally met. So we had met through your wedding planners, Melissa, yes. Hag Melissa Haggerty and Gabby Armania. And uh, they were the ones that introduced us and got us started on this journey. So thank you but to you them. All, yes. But you also did the video for Alex Loeb, who basically she had her wedding in Toronto. And then I had mine maybe like a year after and just like used her wedding planners, used her videographer, used like everything she did. Her wedding was so great. I was like, perfect. I'll just take all the people that you used and apply it to myself. Um, and she showed me her video and I remember watching it in bed. I was like, I think I'm going to cry <laughs> watching this wedding video. It was so beautiful. Oh, thank you. And that's like, it's almost like a template. Like if you have a close friend who's getting married, they were happy with everything they had, then you were kind of thinking maybe we could follow that same template a little bit. Yes, exactly. Everything we did, my husband was like, well, what did Alex and Steven do? We'll just do, we'll just do what they did. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit. I am going to go right back to the beginning because I'm super curious about this. When you were a little girl, mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you were like two, three, four, were you always in the closets? Like, were you in your mom's closet? Were you yeah, I was like full on love to dress up. My grandparents um, 
owned a clothing store in Halifax. And when I was little and we would go visit them, I would sit underneath the register and they had like a CCTV and I would like watch all the shoppers on the camera. And then I would go into the back and play with the adding machine. Like I was always so fascinated by like anything and everything that had to do with like clothes and fashion. Oh, I remember, I think I was like eight or nine. And I remember looking at my mom and being like, my dream is to be locked in Gap Kids overnight. She's like, uh, <laughs> dream big. Yeah. Great dream. Um, but yeah, always, always. And then in high school, was there any element of fashion that kept that little spark alive? Yeah. I mean, I always, and I am thankful for this. My parents, like I would always want to try wearing like weird, unusual things. And they were like always down. Um, and there was like a school fashion show, like all those types of things that I would get involved in. But I always sort of knew that ultimately, I mean, at times I was like, maybe I'll be a psychiatrist or a lawyer, but like, ultimately my end goal was to work in fashion somehow. So, you know, I mean, I wasn't the best student in high school, but I think it's also because I wasn't necessarily learning anything that deep down I knew would help me. Like all the other kids who were like, I'm dying to be a doctor and would work so hard in science. That was not me. So I just did not care. <laughs> and so you, you had jobs in the fashion like field kind of throughout yeah. my school of length forward, right? So when I went to university actually um, in Halifax at Dalhousie and there was a clothing store there, I think it's still open called Foreign Affair. And it's like the like fancy at the time they had like seven jeans and um, like Rock and Republic. It was a very like fancy, cool clothing store. And I think I worked there for three out of the four years that I was in school, just because I liked being around it. I liked all the people that worked there. And when I would come home to Toronto for the summers, I worked at Roots. I worked at TNT. I worked at um, jewelry and like accessories boutique Augustina. So I was always just trying to get as much experience as I could in that sort of world. Did you have, like, when you were doing that, did you have a big dream in mind at all? You just were going with, like, I really enjoyed being in this element. Yeah, I just enjoyed being in it. I think I always thought that I would do, like, fashion PR, but then I went to Parsons after I did my undergrad, and my first internship was in fashion PR, and I quickly realized that that is actually not what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> So I've just, honestly, I knew I wanted to do something in the field. I think what's interesting about fashion is you can say like, I love fashion. I love fashion. But then once you actually get started at looking to make it a career, you realize there's so many facets to it. Do you want to be a buyer? Do you want to be a merchandiser? Do you want to be a designer? Do you want to be a publicist? Do you want to do manufacturing? Do you want, like, there is just so many facets to the industry that I think people don't realize actually like how complex it is. So, you know, it was interesting taking different internships in New York and really finding out what part of the industry I like the best. And when you started the COVID tour, did you were obviously thrown into all of that? Yeah, it's funny. I was recruited for a job back in Toronto um, so I left New York and moved back. I think I was like 23 or 24 and, you know, for a multitude of reasons, like my, the head of our department quit, then my boss quit. So I was just there by myself. Like there were so many reasons why I did not, you know, feel like it was the right fit for me, but I had also, because work was not busy, I'd started freelance styling and got, got an agent in Toronto and I had done it in New York as well. So I was just really focusing on that. And then cover tour started and it really exposed me to honestly, every, I would say, except for design, really like every facet of the industry from, you know, business to social media, to publicity, you know, we met designers, creative directors, magazine editors, just it really opened my eyes to just how many people 
make the industry move forward? So it was originally more of a passion project. Yes, because we it, all still had jobs. And when it launched, it really was, you know, I wasn't satisfied with my job. So what can we do to fill in that time or to find satisfaction in some sort of work, even if it's not, you know, the work you're being paid for? Um, you know, I think it's really important to have something that really makes you feel excited. And you have co-founders as well. Mm -hmm. So my other two co-founders are from Toronto. Um, a girl named Erin Kleinberg, who I had gone to summer camp with, and um, a photographer, Jake Rosenberg, who had gone to camp with Erin's brother. So, you know, the three of us started it. And in the beginning, it was, you know, the three of us sharing hotel rooms in New York when we would come. And yeah, it was very, it was, we were definitely on a budget. So I'm super curious, like when you sat down to discover this idea, were you throwing out ideas purposely? Like, were you, did you yeah. have like a meeting and you were like, let's think about something here? So Erin was designing a line of coats at the time when Jake shot her lookbook and I was a stylist. And then the next day her and I met and we were saying it was so fun to do something creative. And we said we should do something else. And we thought online made sense because it seemed the least expensive. You wouldn't have to like buy fabric or any materials, anything like that. Street style was like really, really, really taking off. So we decided we didn't want to do that because so many people were doing it so exceptionally well. And it's sort the idea sort of came of what is the next step of street style. So these people are on the street and they look great, but how do they get to that point? So, you know, no one walks out on a red carpet looking, no one did that themselves. There's hairstylists, there's makeup artists, there's clothing stylists. There's like a myriad of people who, you know, help put these looks together. So it was part to show the behind the scenes people of the industry and also just to show people's personal style, you know, really what their philosophy towards dressing was. I think that's because this is in 2011 too. So you guys were kind 2010. of 2010. No, 2011. Yes. 2011. So you guys were on the, like, this was new. We were early. Yes. We were early. Yeah. And it was just, I think Instagram, it's like debated either just did or just would launch, but people were only really warming up to the idea of letting people into their spaces or, you know, the editor at the magazine could be just as interesting as the person on the cover. So that shift was slowly happening. So I think the timing was right because people were really warming up to the idea of, you know, more personal exposure. Well, yeah. And I think that's what stands out or definitely stood out back then was bringing the authentic nature of people to the forefront a little bit, right? Because you were going into their homes, essentially. I was going to say there's like no more, the home is really intimate, but then you're in their closet. <laughs> it's like the most intimate. And, you know, then you hear stories like, oh, I forgot I had this sweater. I wore it on my first date or, you know, clothing really has emotional ties and memories attached to it. So, you know, you really get to know a lot about a person. There's a, an element of storytelling within clothing, even, you know, that you don't realize. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 100%. And so what was, what was the response? Like, you know, in the first couple of people that you had messaged and said, Hey, can we, do you mind? Honestly, if it was like a domino effect. People were really open. And then we would shoot someone and they would say, you know, Oh, that was really great. You should shoot my friend X. And their friend X would be like Nikki Hilton or like Joanna Hellman, someone really influential. And then they would say, that was great. You should shoot our other three friends. So it was a really for the first couple of years, it was really like referrals, which was helpful too. And so Jake was taking photo. Was he doing the video as well? Yeah. Oh yeah. We did everything. We were like the stylists, the talent bookers, the writers, the, you know, Jake shot, he edited, we uploaded everything. So it was, you know, now it's so funny. We have, you know, people who sort of help us with all of that stuff now, but yeah, we did everything. Like sleepless nights as well? So, oh yeah, a lot of sleep. I mean, the first, I would say like 
six, five to six years were like a really nonstop. And then I, so almost five years ago now, but had, I remember I was in Miami and I was getting on a plane to come back to Toronto and I called my mom and I was like, I don't feel great. I really do not feel good. And then it turned out I had mono, not from like a wild, like night of passion. I just was so run down. My body was like time out. So I was sick for a couple months. Like I was like, I couldn't drive. Like I was like out of the game. So after that, I started to really, we still work extremely hard, but definitely was conscious to put more sort of boundaries around when to stop working. Was there a point when you were like, okay, I think now we should start looking at bringing people on so that. Yes. And that happened, I think after the first year, um, we, you know, we were just busy and we, you know, started by having interns and then those interns, you know, once we were able to, um, brought them on full time. And all of those initial employees were so helpful and instrumental in us really creating our identity. You know, they helped us shape our voice and our aesthetic and what our, you know, social channels look like. So having, you know, those few employees early on was really, you know, instrumental for us. What do you think was one of the bigger moments of brand creation like what obviously when you launched i know the site crashed (laughs) yeah i think the second biggest moment for us was when we started working with brands because we had originally just featured people and then we were approached by chanel to go to paris with them and do sort of like a five day behind the scenes of the history of chanel so we went to coco chanel's apartment we went to the Masara where they make the shoes. We went to the fine jewelry salon. We really peeled back the curtain on a brand instead of a person. And that was a really big moment for us too. I think one, because the brand itself is pretty secretive, but also it we, you know, branded content and people partnering with brands was still pretty new. And I think the fact that we did that, it demonstrated to our audience that we could do it, but also to other, you know, potential brands. And that's essentially how we really started monetizing the site was through custom content and native advertising. Was the site something you guys created yourself as well? Or was there at one point? No, we had um, actually another guy from Toronto, Ryan Sachs. Um, he has a company called Excite and he built our first site for us. Amazing. And so when did you move to, at what point did you move to New York and you thought, okay, this is, so, was it? Yeah, about five years ago, um, we decided to relocate the company here. We hired a CEO who was based out of New York and, you know, Jake and I got visas and we moved. And now and you're in New York. Here, yeah, we've been here ever since. All through COVID as well. All through, yes. Now we've really spent a lot of time here. Well, we used to be gone, honestly, like at least once or twice a month consistently. And then in March, I mean, we, I haven't been on a plane, like it's, Mm. you know, it's definitely a shift for sure. What's one of the places that you've traveled that have been like on your list of super unique I'm sure you have a ton of experience. Honestly, every place, but like before we really started, I mean, I had think I'd been to um, Italy. I'd been, but you know, not, I'd been to Italy like as a 22 year old or a 17 year old, not as a professional or not with a brand. So honestly, everywhere we went was like a dream. We, our first trip was, to Paris, I'd never been. And then, you know, we ha- were fortunate. We went to Tokyo. We went to Dubai. We went to Milan. Like all of these really outstanding, amazing places. And we got to see them through the eyes of people that live there. And, you know, the experiences were like so over the top and so 
opulent when we were the guests of a brand that it was, it's like, I mean, it's not over, but I just feel like cause people haven't traveled in so long and I don't know when that stuff will happen again, but it was such a like wild rat. It was so now to see how we're living today and to think back about that, you're like, holy shit, that was really opulent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of switch have you seen just in content even? Cause now we're looking at a different, you know, we're in a different world. So yeah, I mean, we're doing a lot of self shot content. So we're still doing closet tours, but now the subject is taking us on a video tour of their closet. And, um, you know, we used to be really adamant on using our own imagery for every article. And now we are using, um, more of our, our own stock images, but also just other images from, you know, people like Getty who the image is just pertains to what we're doing. And I think the use of social content also. So there's definitely been a shift in how, I mean, we used to be like, we have to fly to Miami. We have to fly to LA. We have to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm sure that will come back, but you can actually, you know, create a fair amount of content, I guess, without leaving your house. <laughs> well, it's funny because before this, before COVID happened, all of the podcasts that I had done had been in studio. And so even having now the ability to virtually sit with you and you're in New York and I'm here in Toronto and talk is pretty cool based on the fact uh, of what's happening. I know it's so funny. I always say, you know, the days of, oh my God, we have, we have a meeting in LA, like, should we all go? And then there's three people buying plane tickets and getting on a plane and renting hotels for a meeting. I think are probably gone, you know, why you could just zoom the person. Yeah. That's it's become, it's become the new reality. So, yeah. Um, so we do have obviously an audience of business owners and also a bridal audience. Um, Yay. I would love to know like one or two either stories or, you know, pieces of advice um, from a business perspective that you've, you know, learned over the past 10 years. <laughs> I've say God. um the the best one I've learned like initially when something would go wrong or wouldn't go the way I wanted everything was like a disaster a catastrophe what are we gonna do but so many things like that are gonna get thrown your way and most of the time one way or another they will work out so I think the most valuable lesson is like really try not to freak out unless it is like absolutely <laughs> critical because you will just exhaust yourself. And, you know, I think the other lesson is the importance of, you know, bringing in people who know more than you do in different areas. That was going to be a question was, did you have mentorship or with the three of you, it was like three minds coming together. You were able to produce. Yeah, we were able to in the beginning, but I mean, as a site grew, you know, we hired a really amazing graphic designer who, you know, none of us had her skill set, or, you know, our amazing content director, managing editor, all of these, as we started to create more content, those are roles that we couldn't take on or we had never done before. And we were able to, you know, work with really amazing people who helped us grow the business and put really amazing processes in place that I think we wouldn't have been able to do on our own otherwise. And even at one point, I suppose, needing, like when you knew you were going to grow, needing the funding and needing to learn that element of it as well. Yeah, that was like a real crash course. Um, you know, we raised a small round about a year in and we really like, winged that one on our own and our company was recently acquired and thankfully Ryan my husband is in finance and he was the biggest help him and the owner of his firm um like saved our ass and we learned a ton honestly like having someone really walk us through the entire process and have us be really involved was I was like, oh, this is a real crash course in a lot of finance and math and negotiation and contracts. It was, yeah. I mean, that part is also, I feel fortunate to have been exposed and have been able to learn it because I realized, A, I was interested in it, but B, I think you can then 
give your learnings to other entrepreneurs who may be entering similar types of relationships and it could be tricky. So, you know, I'm happy. I'm always happy to share advice on that specifically because I think we learned a lot. And I think I read something recently too, just about understanding and knowing your networks. And maybe when you have three people, if you actually take a step back and look at who you know in what webs, did you find that exactly. you were you were using those, like you were contacting those people and reaching out based on the fact you could come together in a certain sense? Yeah, honestly. And the other sort of lesson I learned is people are really willing to help. Like you reach out to someone, you're like, I don't know. And then, you know, they respond, I'd be happy to help. People are, you know, really most of the time, like happy to be of help, which is really nice. One of the topics that came up um, on the podcast, just even in this industry, but a long time ago, more in the 2005 timeline, is just how secretive things used to be before social. Because, you know, yeah. it, like with competitors and things like that. And now, obviously, social is kind of blown that out of the water and everyone's willing to share and willing to help. And I think we just keep seeing that grow where people want to be a part of someone's journey if they can and help them. Yeah, and I always say, especially for us, you know, if it came to working with or collaborating with other sites or content creators, like the internet is like limitless. There is enough room for, there truly is enough room for everyone. So why not, you know, come together and try and make something that no one's seen before or, you know, and I think it's nice just to be able to collaborate with people. So that is my, you know, sort of take it's, you know, everyone, there's enough for everyone. Yeah. Instead of thinking so much competition, think collab collaboration a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's move into the wedding day now. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so July 27th, 2019. Yes. You had your big day. And why don't we just get a little bit of background of how you and Ryan met for everyone listening? Yes. Um, Ryan and I were set up by a mutual friend in New York. We went on one date and the next day I really was not feeling well and actually everything was fine, but I went to the hospital and he texted me to follow up. And while, because I was like all over the place, I didn't text him back. And then if he was like, Oh, I guess never mind. And then I, te I was like, Oh shit. I was in the hospital, which sounds like a really lame excuse. Like, okay, sure. Um, and then I actually followed up with him for the second date. And that was it. We went on our second date and the next day we were texting and he said, would you want to do something tonight or Wednesday? And I said, Wednesday. And he wrote back for the record, I would have said tonight. And I said, I would have said tonight too, but I didn't want to seem, you know, overly eager. So we ended up meeting that night. And really, honestly, that I think we've seen been together almost, except if one of us was out of the country together ever since. And we you know, especially now, Ryan was planning on proposing probably later than he did. And he was at lunch with a really good friend of his who was older and was like, you need to propose like now in the next month, you need to like lock it in. You need to seal the deal. And now with COVID, we are like, thank God, because we wouldn't, I don't think have had our wedding. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, it's, we're always thankful for that friend of Ryan's, but we're especially thankful now. So you had honesty right from the second text message. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. you, so Ryan's from Boston, you obviously yeah. grew up in Toronto and then mm -hmm. you decided to have your wedding here. So was there a bit of a decision process with that? It was pretty easy to make the decision. I think just given the price of New York, the venue itself is expensive, but also the ask to ask so many people from Toronto to come and there's hotel, like it's just so astronomically expensive, I think, to come to New York and also to have a wedding here. And we didn't want to not have certain things that we both really wanted. And when we went to Toronto, we met Gabby and Melissa. They were amazing. And it felt different. I mean, I love Toronto so much. Ryan has really come to love it too. And we were excited to have so many people hadn't been. And they're like, it's an hour from New York. Like there was just so much people didn't know. And we just became so excited to show people Toronto. And, 
you know, let people sort of get out of the city during the summer for a weekend. And I think it ended up being such an important part of the wedding. And so even the rehearsal dinner you had the night before, and you had given your guests a bit of an opportunity to see the tower because we were up so yes. high, right? And they were able to see the tower and just get that experience. The weather was bananas nice. Like we, it was beautiful weather. The, I love the venue. Everything really honestly came together. I cannot take truly any credit for it, really. <laughs> I, will, I will honestly say my participation was minimal at best, but um, it just came together like so beautifully. Well, when you were, so if you, when you were little, you were into fashion, were you also like dreaming of the wedding day? Was that a no, part of it? No, it wasn't. this was not who I was. I was shocked that I wore a wedding dress. I was like, I'll, I won't even wear a wedding dress. I'll probably just buy like a dress that I really love. And then I was actually home in Toronto after I'd gotten engaged and my parents were like, just for fun. And I put on a wedding dress and was like, oh my God. I was like, I'm obsessed with wedding dresses. I was like, this is, and I mean, being around clothes so much, you really see how intricately a wedding dress is made and the detail and the structure and the boning and the it's like really putting on a beautiful piece of clothing and they are designed to make everyone like look amazing. And you get to stand on this like platform and then everyone tells you, you look, I was like, this is something I would, I would try on wedding dresses every day of my life. I ended up really loving it so much more than I thought I would. And so you went in Toronto, you looked around you ended up with an Oscar de la Renta. Yes. Ultimately, I ended up, I, then I went from, oh, I don't know if I want a wedding dress into like extreme laser focus on what exact dress I wanted. Obsession. And <laughs> yes, I, had, I really, the pendulum swung the other way. And Oscar de la Renta had just put up on Vogue.com their, you know, collection. And I had seen the dress. I had emailed someone there, but these dresses, they only make one of them and they have to go basically all around the world to every trunk show. So I was basically trying to find a time where myself and the dress would be in New York at the same time. Um, and, you know, I tried it on and really that, and I went by myself. It was the one time, like, I just went by myself, the woman there, um, who was working at Oscar de la Renta at the time was so lovely and a, now a friend of mine, but at the time a very good friend of a close friend of mine. And it was just her and I, and I was like, if you like this dress, I, I feel good about it. So it was pretty low key at what the end do, of it all. What do you think were like three or like two or three of your main prior, like between you and Ryan, what were some of the main priorities for your wedding? Okay. So our main priorities were short ceremony. Like, I think our, I, there are just some that are quite long. We didn't want a speedy one, but we didn't want people to be losing attention after a certain point. Okay. Um, food and alcohol were like very, very big and music. Honestly, we wanted people to, we just wanted it to be a really, really, really good party. And it was, people were still there. It was three in the morning. I was like, I'm leaving. You guys can stay, have, have fun, but I'm exhausted. So I think those were really the priorities. We just, Ryan and I both adore our family and friends so much. And I love his friends and he loves mine. And, you know, because everyone is sort of, you know, we have people from LA, people from London, people coming from all over we had never really had everyone we really love in one room. And that was just, I think, really the priority for us and to make everyone know how, feel how happy and thankful we were that they were there. The ceremony that you had. So I guess I should even paint the picture that you guys were at the fermenting cellar um, yes. for your wedding. And so you had gotten married there as well as had the reception there. And the ceremony was so beautiful. And there was just there was an element of like, it was just still because you had the collective attention, which most ceremonies do, but it was just like this beautiful 
vibe in the room and then there was a bit of humor that was infused into it because <laughs> yeah we honestly it is not a time to be I think it's just a time to enjoy yourself really and you know people are getting a look at something so intimate and you know Ryan right when we first met we both realized I mean love actually is like literally his favorite movie I also really enjoy it and we had planned in secret as a surprise for everyone to do in the wedding scene there when the guy surprises the bride and groom with all you need is love. We wanted to surprise the audience. So we worked with our wedding planners and our um, cantor and the band and the band members were like dispersed in the audience and then they got up and sang and we just loved it. Yes. We were very proud of ourselves that we pulled it off because it was really a secret. No one knew. It was a secret. And we even went through the logistics the night before I had come down to the fermenting cellar and was Oh there. yes. It was a big, yeah. Like co secret ops mission. It was. And so, yeah, like it was during the ceremony, there was even timed. So after the cancer said something, then, you know, it started to unravel and your guests looked a little shocked. Like what's happening? What's going on? I know. On? I know. We, love, we love a good surprise. And we also thought, yes, I don't know why we did this, but we were, we didn't take any dance lessons. And then we were like, we should take one literally three days before the wedding. What we had learned was more intricate than what we did. But that was also something that I was like, I would never like do that traditional dance. Then honestly, once it came close, I was like, wait, I love all these things. I'm going to do all of them. So we, we just had a good time. It was a good time. And yeah. it was a fun party. A fun party. If you bring, so we had, um, we flew in from New York, which was like the one more extravagant thing we did, the cake balls from Momofuku Milk Bar. Mm -hmm. And then we had McDonald's, like cheeseburgers and fries at midnight come out. So everyone sort of got a second wind. And honest to God, that is one of the things that people talk about the most when we talk about our wedding. They're like, the cheeseburgers, the McDonald's, the milk bar. Um, so yeah, food was a big priority for us. That's interesting because we talk a lot about infusing personality on the podcast into your wedding and understanding. And you did that by surprising your guests by having during the ceremony. Yes. having like a surprise, you know, surprise. Yeah. And then also the end of the evening, which is kind of your last takeaway as a guest at a wedding too. Oh yeah. We, yes. It was so funny. One of Ryan's friends was like dancing so hard. He split his pants <laughs> and went back to the four seasons and then came back to the wedding at like one in the morning. Oh. <laughs> I know he's now, he's like my new, after I heard that I was like, Oh, so he's my new favorite person in the entire world. What a, baller move. I wish we had that in the bloopers reel. I <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So do you have any, now that you've done it and you've gone through it, do you have any key pieces of advice for anyone getting married into 2021? So I was a very much, I mean, I can't speak to what, you know, a wedding in 2021 might look like, but I do know for me, like I'm not a wedding planner. So I, my philosophy was very much, there are people who know a lot more than you do about this and who do it a lot better. And you should probably leave the majority of things up to them, obviously with input, but not really trying to micromanage the process because I mean, I, I doubt you would know something that your wedding planner doesn't know or has never heard of. So, and I think it just makes you so stressed when you are you know, really in the weeds. Obviously we were involved, but it was not micromanaged. I mean, at least I don't think it was. You can ask our wedding planner, but <laughs> that is, yeah, I think that's, you know, and honestly do the things that are important to you. And I think no matter what, if the energy is good and everyone, the bride and groom are like happy and celebrating and people can like feel the love in the room, then everything else kind of falls into place. And I think by infusing a little bit of, you know, your couple personality to that, it'll really bring out that yeah. in, your, in your guests as well. Yeah. It just gives people a chance, I think, to know you guys as a couple. 
It was really funny. There were some of your guests that were really not camera shy whatsoever. <laughs> they loved- it's not a shy bunch of people. I will tell you by any stretch of the imagination, it is not a shy group. And it was cute because they would see a camera and then they really like, they were kind of going for it. So that was really fun. And it makes for fun footage too. Yes. Everyone was like very involved. Amazing. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for your time today. I really appreciate you sitting in thank you. on the podcast. It's been so nice to see you again. You too. I hope to see you in person soon. Absolutely. Let me know next time you're in Toronto. I'd love to, I would love to see you. I will. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Okay.